We are now live on Facebook, and uh, I am welcoming again today Todd Mintz live from South Africa. Good evening, Todd. Today it's oh, Hi, you've got Sarah. A <laughs> Babidi with Todd and Sarah. All right. So Kuchina Quarantena goes to South Africa tonight. Uh, so he's with me live from South Africa, and we're going to be cooking a dish I had never heard of until he proposed it. So uh, sounds like a little bit like moussaka, right? Okay, well, the, the, let me quickly tell you a little bit. Hi, everybody. It's uh, it's uh, seven twenty p.m. in South Africa, so I'm already drinking red wine. Where Sarah's on the coffee, I think. Um, but a little bit about the history of the of babuti as a dish. Um, it originates from the Cape, one of our provinces down south. Um, when the Dutch arrived in 1652, they brought a lot of slaves to start uh, developing the Cape as a uh, as a refreshment station for the ships going to India. And many of those slaves came from various parts of Africa, as well as Indonesia and Malaysia. So the Malaysian cooking and Indonesian style of cooking became very much a part of the, uh, of the culture in the Cape amongst what we call the Cape colored people who are of mixed race. So these are people who have ancestors going back into the slave people that arrived early. And then of course, with the Europeans that arrived being Dutch, French Huguenots, German, British, they, of course, you know, integrated um, with some of the slaves over years, over a 200 year period, and you had what was known as the Cape Malay people. Uh, even though only a small percentage were actually from Malaysia, they were known as the Cape Malay people and now known as the Cape Colored people. So Babuti originates from that era of the 17th century, as far back as that, where they used ingredients that they could locally, you know, source. So they were growing lemons, for instance, and they were bringing herb, yeah, getting spices from the ships that were arriving in the harbor, which had been newly created. Uh, they had goats. So some of the early recipes were actually using goat meat. Uh, sheep, of course, was also used as well. But then later on, um, um, ground beef, as we call it, mince, was the staple. Tonight, I'm using ostrich. It's very popular now to use ostrich in the booty. Yep, ostrich is very available. I don't know if you, it's backwards on the screen, but this is something we buy in the stores in South Africa. We have a, a huge ostrich area in South Africa, one of the biggest farming ostrich areas in the world. Um, and ostrich is extremely healthy. It's lean, there's no fat. You don't see a fat ostrich. They don't get fed hormones. They eat natural food. They, they live in an area called um, um, Oatshoorn, which is uh, in the Eastern Cape, uh, sorry, no, it's part of the Western Cape inland from, uh, from the coast. And there the natural vegetation uh, is fantastic for them. And of course the farmers also feed them things like lucerne, which is a very healthy way to, to feed them as well. They eat a lot of lucerne and a lot of corn. What is that lucerne? I don't know. Lucerne, uh, alfalfa. Oh, okay. Same thing. So ostrich meat, I like using it when I make spaghetti bolognese, when I make babuti, because there's no fat. So you don't get that big layer of fat sitting on the top. Yeah. Um, now, your, your guests on the show, um, I, as I said to you the other night or last night, in fact, I'm not the kind of guy that always sticks to recipes unless it's baking. And I've been cooking this dish for a long time in the bush for my clients, sometimes on the open fire. Um, so really? I've got, yep, absolutely. I, I do a lot of meals on the open fire. So you can uh, use a sort of a cast iron dish with a lid that you can then put the coals on the top if you're going to bake it because there's a baking process as well. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, we did that in Romania last year, or year before last. Yeah, we did that where we could yeah, you can bake a cake that way as well with a cast yep. iron dish. So, yep. um, so there's a couple of rules that I'm going to be breaking on this. Um, one of the, the traditional recipes call for you to soak bread in milk and then add it to it. This is very similar to what Americans would call a meatloaf the way it's ah, okay. prepared, yeah. very similar. But I find with the bread, especially using ostrich, being no fat, it dries out the dish quite a lot. And the origins of adding bread to this dish go back once again to the, the slave period where bread was just to bulk it up because meat was obviously hard to get. So they would use a little bit of meat and then bulk up the dish with the bread and make it you know, a bigger portion. So I'm staying away from the bread on this, but some of the basic ingredients which we're gonna be using um, I've kind of put them all into one here. Um, what I've done is I've actually prepared two dishes, one that's already finished, I did it this afternoon, and one that I'm going to do live now. But the equivalent of these two dishes would be for about four people. So each dish is a small dish, uh, which would be for about two people. So all the ingredients that I'm going to tell you about and the quantities divide, I've divided in half. 
So for instance, my major spices in this dish are coriander. Of course, you can use fresh herbs if you can find them. At the moment, coriander is a little bit difficult to get in the stores in South Africa, and I don't have it growing in my garden. But uh, coriander um, is one of the, the main ingredients. Um, cumin is another ingredient that's very important. Uh, paprika and then a curry, uh, a curry powder. You can choose a, a hot curry powder if you want or a mild curry powder. Cape Malay food is very different to Indian food. Uh, they have similarities in their spices. There we go. But uh, with Cape Malay food, they like to combine spice and sweet. So you don't have that heavy chili uh, effect with Cape Malay food. It's more sort of uh, toned down and a lot of sweetness as well in their dishes. So besides the, the cumin, the coriander, the paprika, a little bit of cinnamon and a little bit of go, uh, uh, sorry curry powder, we've also going to be adding raisins. Now, babuti is not babuti without raisins. Some people don't use raisins in their babuti because a lot of people don't like raisins. But once again, this comes back from the historical uh, um, area of Cape Town where they were growing grapes, so raisins were easily available. So that became part of getting the sweetness to the dish. Traditional recipes also call for apricot jam. There we go. Apricot okay. jam. Jam is uh, jelly, I think you call it, or marmalade, um, yeah. or chutney. Some people use both. I prefer to use chutney in South Africa. If there's any South Africans in the States, they will know Mrs. Bull's chutney. Man, is no better chutney than Mrs. Bull's, and this is made from peaches. So chutney is also originates from India. It's part of the sambals that you would have in an Indian dish. So this particular one that I'm using is made from peaches. So I'm not using the apricot jam, but your, your uh, guests can use apricot jam for that slight little bit of sweetness. So for a dish, of course, so let me get back to the ingredients. Then we're gonna have some fresh lemon. Okay, yeah, I got lemon. Okay. Yeah. Got lemon. Yeah. Um, some... Yeah, there we go. All right, then I've got some, I've got some chopped up garlic and I've got some chopped up ginger. Very important. Okay. I can do that. Fresh ginger, fresh top ginger. Uh, if you can, fresh, that's great. Uh, if you have powdered ginger, that, that, that's okay. At the moment, ginger and garlic prices in South Africa have gone crazy. Uh, really? And then, yeah. Um, I usually would use raisins. I'm using sultanas. They're very similar in, in effect and taste, but either one, sultanas or raisins, works fine. Either one is yeah, fine. I've got the same thing. Okay, tomato paste. Just to give your beef a little bit of a, well, I'm using Oshi to give your ground meat a little bit of flavor. So I've got some tomato paste. Yep. Um, fresh onion. Yep. Chopped up some fresh onion. Okay. Um, and then, of course, towards the end, the topping of the babuti is going to be what we call a, a egg custard. So there's going to be eggs and a little bit of milk. Okay. okay. Eggs and milk. So uh, and this will, it's going to have like a fluffy, a fluffy cream yeah. topping. Yeah. yeah, you'll see what happens. Uh, and also what I add to that egg and milk, which is my own little trick, is a dash of nutmeg. Ah, that's a good choice. Yeah. Dash of nutmeg. And then, of course, salt and pepper as well. And then also when I'm, when I'm going to be cooking the, 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 the ground meat, which is ostrich or beef, um, I also add a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. I don't know if you know Worcestershire sauce Worc or Maggie. Yeah, yeah it's just that. to give the beef a little bit of flavor. Okay. Yes, you I love adding of, that actually. It gives it yeah. such a depth. You can like, use a bit of stock if you want as well. That's another option. Um, right. A lot of recipes call for, you know, preparing your beef and your onions and your spices, or in this case, ostrich, to use olive oil or your sunflower oil. Um, I'm a big fan of coconut oil, so I use coconut oil in this one. Okay, it also gives okay. it a nice flavor. So, as I said, I've got two dishes, one prepared and one I'm going to prepare now. So you can see the result without waiting for it to bake. So, the ingredients that I've worked out here is for, let's say, about four people. So we're looking at about a tablespoon of, um, of each of the spices, okay? Um, one whole onion. Okay. Um, about two tablespoons of uh, um, tomato paste, a tablespoon of garlic, a tablespoon of ginger. But it's very much a dish you can throw as much as you like in. You know, it's really, there are not a lot of rules with this. Um, but those are the basic ones that I've done there. So what kind of pan um, am I using? Sorry? What kind of pan do I need to use? Okay, what I'm using for, I've already, because this, this, this dish is accompanied with rice. I've already cooked the rice. Okay. So it's, just, yeah, and I've used basmati rice. You can use other fragrant rices if you want, jasmine rice if you want. Some people also add turmeric to the rice to give it some color. 
I haven't done that because I put quite a lot of turmeric in the food itself as well. So, and as we know, turmeric is great because it's an, an antioxidant, I mean, a, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Anti-inflammatory. Okay. Yeah. So if you can get fresh turmeric, all the good. I've just got a regular saucepan. Okay. Regular saucepan. And then your babuchi is going to go into the oven in a Pyrex dish or something that can handle some heat. It can be glass or ceramic. But theoretically, I could cook it in this and then just bake it in this. That's fine. You right. can use the wok and then you're just going to transfer it into a dish that can go in the oven for it to Sweet. bake okay. for about All right, minutes. get going. All right, cool. Okay. You can also preheat your oven as well. In South Africa, we work on centigrade, not Fahrenheit. Okay. So I'm not sure what the conversion is, but, um, you know, probably put it on to quite hot to start with. Um, on your plate, if you're using gas, that's great as well. Um, and then you're going to add your onion. Uh, sorry, first of all, just add about a tablespoon of your coconut oil. So about a tablespoon. I love coconut oil. I'm really getting addicted to using it. It gives the food such Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. I really like yeah. it. Let me just turn up my volume so I can hear you better. Right, and then once that coconut oil starts getting nice and hot, um, you can throw the onions in. You can use red onions if you prefer. I've just used a regular onion. So obviously I'm using half an onion now because I've, I've divided all my ingredients in half to make two dishes instead of one. But this is roughly for four people, you'd use one whole onion in your pan. And I've just got keep that that onions. My, my oven is fairly quick, it'll start getting hot. Then what we're going to do is what I've done with all my spices is I've combined them. So one table, uh, sorry, um, one teaspoon of cumin, one teaspoon of coriander. I'll just wait for you, Sarah. Sorry. Yeah, hang on a sec. Let me get the onions rolling here. There we Now I'm going to grab a little bowl. Yeah, just get a little bowl. I like to mix all my spices together, make a little... Okay, little so let's make the spice mix again. You said uh, one teaspoon one, of one coriander. One, yeah, one teaspoon of uh, cumin, one teaspoon of coriander. Okay, got it. Two teaspoons of curry powder. Can be mild, can be hot, it's totally up to yourself. One teaspoon of paprika. Or paprika. Yeah, okay. that's cool. And then about half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Okay. Oh, that's all I've got left, so that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. That's all good. And then one teaspoon of turmeric. I have an extremely well-stocked spice cabinet. Luckily, I have everything you asked for. Excellent. excellent. And then also <laughs> you can put in uh, uh, two teaspoons of herbs. I've just used a, a regular sort of mixed herbs, but if you've got herbs growing in your garden, like oregano or uh, basil or anything green, but I just use a regular mixed spice or Italian herbs, which is a bit of everything, uh, and put about two teaspoons of that into the mix. Okay. My onions are starting to sizzle. I'm gonna move them off for a second. Okay, you want to stir all of that up? Okay. All right. And then when your onions are starting to sizzle and starting to get a little bit golden, take all of that, mix it all around, and just put four teaspoons of that mixture in. Whatever's left, you can use again. I'm just trying to make it simple. Okay, so put four teaspoons in into the into your pan with your onions. Four teaspoons. Okay, so there will be some left over, right? Sorry, not teaspoons, tablespoons. Tablespoons. Okay. It's a little okay. bit too much. Yeah. So I'm going to put most of this into the onions now. Yeah, most of that should go in. In fact, with it, you're making for four, so you can put all of that in. That's not a problem. Oh, all right. All of it. Okay, cool. And then stir that around into your onions, um, just so that you can mix in with the onions a little bit and get a little bit of heat on it. Start getting some nice smells. 
Try not to let it stick to the pan too much. All right, once it's kind of into your onions, just move your pan to the side. I'm gonna have a sip of wine. <laughs> Take a break and have a sip of wine. All right, that's part of the instruction on the recipe, right? There we go. <laughs> I learned some good smells. You should start getting some good, some good smells now. Oh, one last ingredient that I forgot, sorry, is bay leaves. You know ah. bay leaves? Yep. So put about four bay leaves. I'm going to put two because I'm, I'm doing half of what you're doing. Okay. Put about four bay leaves in there. Bay leaves is a very important part of this dish. All right, so it's looking pretty roasty toasty. So what's next? All right, take it to one side for a second because now we're gonna we're gonna add the meat. All right. So we're looking at for a you know for about four people, you're looking at probably around about six or seven hundred grams of meat. You can go for a kilogram of meat if you really want to, you know, you can up it up to six people. I've just cooked two batches of 250 grams each. And I've got uh, a pound, so I'm doing half there a you go. That'll do fine. Okay, put that in your pan and just start sort of messing it up so that if you get some onion in there and some of your spices, you can turn your heat down a little bit. You don't want to burn the meat, you just want to start browning it. And at this point, you also can add a little bit of the Worcestershire sauce or Maggie, whatever seasoning that you want to add to it, or stock. Some people add a bit of stock, but I'm just putting a, a liberal amount of Worcestershire sauce in there. What, like three or four shakes? There we go, looking good, looking good. Okay. okay. Just start getting that meat nice and brown. All right, then you take your lemon, cut it in half, and squeeze your lemon into there. Putting a half a lemon in? Really? Half a lemon, believe me. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> This is an extremely, extremely good dish for you guys having winter. You've got garlic, you've got ginger, you've got lemon, all the things you need to fight off any nasty things. So I don't need to squeeze it, I don't need to zest it, I just throw the whole darn thing in. Also it depends on the size of your lemon. Yeah, that's, okay. that'll be fine, 100%. All right. Okay, so you've got the lemon in there now. Got a bit of liquid. Okay, next step, throw in your garlic and your ginger. All of it. And you can add more if you so feel. Garlic and ginger, I always say there are no limits to that. Also really good for you, healthy. You see your mince should start getting nice and brown. Just try not to let it catch too much on the pan. You've got to walk, so that's perfect. Uncle Roger would be very proud of you. This is uh, my, it's called a chef's pan, it's kind of halfway between a saute pan and a wok, and it's my best pan, I love it, I make everything in it. Yeah, there's actually a wok hanging up on the, on the side of the wall next to me, which I love as well. But then I use gas, it's much better to use gas with a wok, now I'm cooking on electricity. Um, you can preheat your oven now to about 180 degrees centigrade, which I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. I put it Sorry. on to uh, about 375 or 400. There we go, that'll yeah. do. Okay, how are we looking? Starting to get some nice color? Yeah, it looks great and it smells fantastic. Oh, it's gonna smell good, it's, it's gotta smell good. If it doesn't smell good, you've done something wrong. <laughs> Very fragrant, I mean, we've got so many interesting spices in here. <laughs> All right, so here's what I'm looking like so far. Oh yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, now you add your uh, tomato paste. Okay. Looking at about two, two tablespoons of tomato paste. Also give it a nice color and then give it some balance, nice acidity coming in there as well. You've got the lemon, you've got the tomato and then all those spices, it's just gonna be fantastic. You can turn it down quite a bit now. You don't want it to be sort of cooking too much because it's also going to spend some time in the ovens. You just want it to, to be warm, basically, just to absorb all the flavors. Okay. Cool. Of course, salt and pepper to your taste. Whatever you fancy, is however much you want. Also, depending on the quality of your meat, uh, ostrich has quite a lot of flavor, so you don't really have to put too much salt and pepper in. 
but that's totally up to yourself. All right, and then take about, I'm gonna use about half a handful, you're gonna use about a handful of raisins and throw them in. Sultanas work just as well. If people who are watching don't like raisins or sultanas, we will forgive them and they can do it without, but traditionally you would put that in the dish. Seriously, Todd, I would never, ever have thought to put these ingredients in one dish. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, it's an unusual dish. It's even spelt unusually and it's pronounced unusually. Some people say baboti, especially the British, or babuti. Yeah. Um, and, and as I say, um, any of your, your um, listeners who are watching or, or your viewers, they can just Google the word babuti and you're going to get recipes from all over South Africa from so many different chefs. It's a very, very popular dish. Every restaurant in Cape Town serves it. Um, when I'm on tour with Reed, um, with Imprint, we go to the Boer Carp area, which is the old Cape Malay slave area, which has been rejuvenated. And they offer tours, which are actual cooking tours. You can actually go and cook babuti with the, the people where it originates from, which is always great. It's like going to Thailand and learning to cook Thai. So you can go to Cape Town and learn to cook. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the, the lid on my mince now and I'm going to turn it off. Okay. So you can just turn yours off. You don't have to, to worry about cooking it too much longer. It will, it will still keep cooking a little bit in there. Because ground beef, you know, you, you don't want to overcook it. It's, it cooks very fast because already all the tissues have been broken down in the grinding process. Right. How are we doing? We're doing good. I'm just checking comments to see if anybody's got questions and they so I'll, have another, add. I'll, have another, I'll have another sip of wine. All right. You have your sip of wine. So uh, there's mm. a question about what kind of meat we're using. I'm using ground beef. Todd's using ostrich. So, and also yeah, we, forgot the, we forgot the chutney. Oh, the chutney. Okay. Uh, and the yeah. one of questions was the entire lemon or just the juice? The entire lemon, right? Just the juice. Just the juice. Just oh, the juice. I put the whole lemon in. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Take it out now. Just the juice. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, just squeeze the whole lemon's juice into the pan. It's fine that you had it in there. You'll get a little bit of lemon zest. It's no problem. Yeah, actually, it, that was not a terrible idea because it's, it's very fragrant. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, just the lemon juice, not the whole lemon. Perfect. And All then right. about two, about two tablespoons, two tablespoons of chutney, or if you don't have chutney, you can use marmalade, or you can use apricot or peach jam, or what you call jelly, I think. I'm using an orange and fig spread. Fantastic. Just something that's going to give it some sweetness together with the sultanas or the raisins. That's very much part of Malay cooking. Okay. And as I say, all these ingredients were things that were available in the Cape when it was um, a refreshment station under the, the Dutch um, before the British arrived. Okay, I think, I'm, I think I'm good. Okay, cool. You can just leave that now, let it just calm down and absorb those flavors. The next phase we're gonna go into now is making the custard for the topping. So you're gonna put about four tablespoons of milk into a, into a jug or a measuring dish of some kind. About four tablespoons. Okay, okay. And then we're gonna crack two eggs. You're gonna use four. Because remember, I'm, I've halved everything to make two dishes. Gotcha, gotcha. One that's complete and one that's going in the oven now. So two eggs, you're gonna put four eggs, sorry, four eggs. Fantastic. And a pinch, a pinch of turmeric. Be careful. Turmeric. I mean, not turmeric, nutmeg. Okay. It's very strong in flavor. So just a little pinch and that'll do the trick. And then you want to get a whisk or a fork and just beat it up. Just want to get a little bit of air in there, get it nicely mixed up. This is so fast. I can't believe how quickly this is get coming together. Such a good quick dish. You can do this in literally 20 minutes. That's why it's a great dish to cook when you're on a tour in the bush. 
because it gives you more time to sit around the fire and socialize and less time of preparing. It's a really I love that you cook for your for your tour members. That's I've done that a few times, and I don't know what it is about cooking for my tour members. It is such a joy. It's so much fun. Yeah, cool. I mean, uh, when I very first started doing you know overland tours with backpackers to keep the prices down, we did everything on on the fire. I mean, we cooked everything on the fire. That's so Barbecues, cool. pasta, whatever. It was always on the fire or on, on gas that we had with us in the vehicle. But it is nice to sit around a fire and actually watch somebody preparing a, a meal for you. Cool, so we got the egg going there. Okay, now what you're gonna do is gonna get your, your dish that you're gonna be using in the oven, whether it's a ceramic dish or a, a metal dish for the oven, whatever you need. And you're gonna transfer, I'm gonna your, use babuti in, you know, transfer your babuti into the dish and leave a, a, you know, at least, depending on the size of your dish, just leave a, you know, 10 centimeters or whatever for your egg. Okay. I'm super lazy, so I'm going to leave uh, the babuti in the pan and bake it in the pan. No problem. That's not a problem at all. But just so mash it down and pour the egg over the top. Yeah, I'll get to that. Just let me show you. I'm just going to add the mince now. I've made quite a lot because um, it won't go to waste. <laughs> it's one of my favorite dishes. So, you know, your mince is, and all your ingredients now is pretty much halfway there. Well, it's, it's pretty much cooked. Um, the next phase is really just to get the egg to bake on the top, which is what babuti is all about. So I'm using quite a small dish here. As you can see, I've left a little bit of space on the top. I'm going to take the egg. I'm literally just going to pour it off the back of the fork all over the mince. It's not going to sink to the bottom. It's a strange thing there. It's going to stay on top. Are you still with me? I am. I'm pouring right now. That's looking fantastic. It smells so good. <laughs> and I, I mean, I hate to sound like surprised, but <laughs> when I looked at the recipe, <laughs> I was a little bit like, uh, okay. <laughs> That's great. That's going to be so cool. All right. And then you just take a couple of bay leaves and put them on the top just for decoration. You can make a little three leaf clover. It looks pretty. And then you gently place that in the oven. All right, very pretty. There we go. And then you want to keep it on bake for about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, and then you want to put it on grill for about five minutes just to brown the top nicely. But when it's on grill, just keep an eye on it. Now I'm going to take my little the booty here that I've put in there, and I'm going to take out the one out that we're going to eat for dinner. Uh, let me just see if you can see that. Can you see that? I it's can. Very... Look how pretty that is. Well, there we go. Gorgeous. And then, of I... course, the traditional way you would serve it with some rice. I've got jasmine rice, one of my favorites. You can use any kind of rice you want, and you can add a little bit of. Um, uh, Debs, don't you want to grab some mint for me? I'm just talking to my sister. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's going to grab some fresh mint, just so it looks pretty. Um, and then we're going to take... So this would be enough for two people, what I've, what I've cooked here, with a, a, a nice size helping per person. I've got a nice crust on top, which is great. Still sizzling. There we go. Bear with me a second. And then it is served traditionally like with Indian food. It's served with sambals, as they call them. So the sambals that we're going to use for this one, I just got them in the fridge here. Let me find them. Is... Um, this just is an accompaniment for your your um, your dish, which is fantastic. So we've got some tomato and onion chopped up, and I've put in some oregano, as we we call it oregano. You call it oregano, which is growing in my garden, but traditionally you would use coriander, fresh coriander. I'm going to add a little bit of balsamic vinegar to that, just a little splash, and I'm going to add some brown sugar just like half a teaspoon so for your dish for four people 
make it, I, you could use one whole tomato and a small piece of onion to get this little sambal going. Now that would be on the side, like that. And then of course, another one which you're gonna think is strange, but most Indian food and also um, Malay food is also served with an accompaniment of banana. Banana? Also, banana, yeah, there we go. Believe me, it works. Uh, if you go to a very authentic curry restaurant, they should be giving you banana, sambals, and even coconut sometimes, but that's not a Cape Malay thing. So there we go, guys. Babuti. Gorgeous. Look at that. So we've got the, the mince, and on top is the egg, which is browned nicely, some beautiful white rice, jasmine rice, some banana, and some tomato and onion sambal. Delicious. How that easy was that? That is fantastic. I wish I was in the kitchen with you there, Todd. And someday I will be, I promise. I'll come and visit you someday and you can make it for me in person. I don't know no if mine will turn out as good, but you know, it'll probably be fine. And I have teenagers, so it doesn't really matter how it turns out. They'll eat it. Okay, after about 15 minutes, you'll see the egg is starting to bake and then just put it on grill and keep an eye on it so that it doesn't burn. Okay. It'll get nice and brown on top. They're going to love it. They're absolutely going to okay. love it. Wow. Okay. Well, this has been so great, Todd. And you're so fast. It's been really fun. So uh, for all of you watching out there, um, again, this is Todd, who is in South Africa. And he and Reed are going to do a Southern African uh, tour uh, this year. And then I think I'm going to be working with him probably next year or the year after. So we'll see. We'll get something on the calendar. Um, cool. And all of the recipes that we've gone through today, I'm going to sit down and write down. <laughs> so yeah. it'll be yeah, in the comments. Can you can anybody just google the word babuti b-a-b-o-t-i-e and they will find recipes for it but as i say your main ingredients are coriander cumin paprika curry uh, turmeric a little bit of cinnamon a little bit of herbs garlic ginger lemon a little bit of sweetness in the form of a jam or a chutney and then it combined all of that in the various stages into the into the ground mince or ostrich if you can get it I mean, you could use lamb mince for this as well. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. Um, and then add your raisins as well, and then top it off with a little bit of a, uh, an egg uh, custard, which is egg and milk uh, with a dash of, of nutmeg in that, and then let it bake for about 15 minutes and about five minutes under the grill. So, you know, you're looking at about 10 to 15 minutes prep time and probably 30 minutes cooking time. It's really easy. Really easy, and I like how flexible it is too. So you can add and subtract ingredients depending on your. And, and for you know, it's tasty, so kids will love it, and it's full of full of nutrition. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Todd. This has been a lot of.